in our postmodern Western society today, which is very secular, there is probably no virtue that is under more assault, that is more despised and hated by the world than the virtue of chastity. Why is the devil attacking this virtue almost more than any other in our day and in our time? And we've seen the assault grow since the sexual revolution in the 1960s, but it's reached a fever pitch today in the West. And here's the thing. We Christians aren't simply being judgmental about chastity. We hold to chastity because we know that without chastity, there is no freedom. And worse, there is no love. How do we recover chastity in an age filled with lust and that is lost from all truth about the human good of sexuality? That's what we're going to talk about tonight. I'm so excited tonight to be joined by Jason Everett. He's the foremost speaker in the Catholic world, I believe, on the virtue of chastity. Jason's dedicated his life and his ministry for the last two decades to teaching about chastity. He's spoken in six continents to probably over a million uh, people live on chastity to high school, college, and adults. And so, you know, Jason, I'm so glad you're with us today. And I think a lot of people in our audience want to know, how can we find resources and how do we live as Christians and how do we even talk about chastity in a culture that really doesn't want to tolerate any discussion about this virtue, does it? No, it's not a remarkably open. As much as they celebrate diversity, it's diversity as long as you agree with us. But uh, what I've found is people uh, personally tend to be remarkably open to it. What I find in the schools, they're actually hungry for it. And we've been mm. speaking to 20 years and we've never had one disrespectful audience. Inner city, public high schools, to me, they're starving for this stuff. And they, but like I think Steve Jobs said, people don't know what they want until you show it to them. And so first you gotta show them the link between chastity and real love, then they realize that it's what they wanted all along. That link is so important, Jason. You know, and I think a lot of people in the world today are cynical about chastity. In fact, I think a lot of people in the public discourse don't even know what chastity is or that it is a virtue. But you talk about how young people are hungry for it. There obviously is a hunger for them to find authentic chastity. Why do you think that is? Well, because they've been gorging on the counterfeit, which is lust. And that's just not going to satisfy you. It's, I mean, lust isn't like just what we ought not do. I mean, lust isn't who we are. Because if we're made in the image and likeness of God, who's love, then to live in any other way is acting against our own nature. And that's why it, it ne never satisfies. And so I remember mean, one high school boy said to me, Jason, you know, I go home from school on Friday and I watch 12 hours of pornography on Saturday. Then on Sunday, I wake up and I watch 12 more hours of pornography on Sunday, and then I come back to school on Monday. That's my weekend. He said, I don't even enjoy it anymore. It's kind of disgusting, but I don't know how to live without it. Like, you'd think these kids are jaded, but they're remarkably receptive to wanting to find a better path of authentic freedom instead of, you know, bondage and slavery to their hormones. Yeah, you use the term uh, slavery, and I think that's an important one for people to understand. You know, St. Paul in Romans 8 talked about how slavery comes out of sin, that if we live in the habits of sin, we become slaves. But there's probably few things that are more enslaving and addicting than pornography. Why don't we talk about how, uh, porno how, how pornography robs people of their freedom? Yeah, I once heard a definition of freedom that intrigued me. It, it was that freedom is not the ability to do whatever you want to do. It said, freedom is the ability to do what you do not want to do in order to do what is good. Mm. And it was a really interesting twist on it, that if I can't say no to my sexual impulses, I mean, my yes really means nothing. And so it promises us this satisfaction, distraction, and pleasure, and oh, it's not a big deal, nobody's getting hurt, it's like a victimless crime. But then when it's all said and done, it, it's this ever diminishing rewards with an ever greater, greater craving. So the more you look at it, the more you want, but the less you're satisfied. And so it's just the, this downward spiral that people get sucked into and they don't know how to break free. And then it becomes disastrous to their marriage. It impairs their ability even to find their vocation. And if the pure in heart can see God, 
then their whole faith begins to erode as well. Not only faith in God, but faith in themselves and marriage and love. And so this is not some victimless crime. I think this is robbing more people of their vocations than anything. When I get emails constantly from beautiful, young, adult, single Catholic women ready to get started on their vocations, and they can't find anybody. They're telling me, Jason, like even in the Catholic young adult circles, I'll go on two dates with a guy, and then it comes out, he looks at porn, and he wants to date me. And they'd say, look, I tell the guy, look, you can't ask me to commit to you when you're not even ready to be faithful to me. And so it's emasculating men and making them effeminized, you know, all over the globe. And I think the women often are the ones who suffer the most for this because they want to get started on their vocations. And it's not that only guys look at pornography, you know, lust is a human problem. But man, it's causing a mess when it comes to finding real love. You know, Jason, you mentioned two things there that I think uh, people oftentimes don't connect, but I think they're very connected, as you said. And that is, first off, freedom, that, that the loss of chastity means a loss of freedom. But the other casualty when we lose our freedom is we lose the capacity to love. And I think that's exactly what you're talking about in this example uh, that, you know, of this young man who's addicted to pornography. And, and you know, the, the girl in that story has the wisdom to know he's not free to love me. Right. Yeah. That's 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 so sad. Yeah. I mean, because you, you can't give what you don't possess. And if I don't have self mastery, I can't make a gift of myself. And so chastity, I mean, it frees you to know if you're really being loved, because if a person's not willing to get rid of that stuff to be with you, they don't love you. But then it also frees you to love rightly. I love when John Paul II talks about purity, because he talked about like with Adam and Eve, that Adam was able to give Eve all the peace of the interior gaze, meaning that when he looked at her body, he didn't look at her as something to be used for his gratification. And as a result of his holiness, he was able to have this ability to look rightly upon her body with love. Whereas when lust creeps into the picture, a woman can perceive that, not, not just like from in the bedroom, like a woman can perceive it a football field away if a guy's looking at it wrong. I mean, it creates this, this restlessness, this vulnerability, even this resentment, where it's only through purity that the human becomes capable of authentic intimacy. And that's why when married couples, like the guy's like, well, let's bring porn in the bedroom and spice things up. It's like, no, I mean, if you have to look to another for satisfaction, it creates a wound of sexual betrayal and trauma to your spouse that you don't even know how to look at her rightly. I remember one college guy saying like, uh, you know, being challenged about looking at porn, being in college, and he, don't you think that could be a problem in your marriage? And he said, well, why would that be a problem in marriage? Like, isn't that what a wife is for? It's like, oh, well, actually not. You know, marriage isn't really the fulfillment of porn. Porn's the distortion of real love. Yeah, it is a distortion. It reminds me of what uh, St. John Paul II, who you mentioned, he talked about using versus loving, and that's a concept people need to get their minds around today, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. You know, and it's, it's not that it's going only one way either. You know, it's not like all the bad guys are the guys are bad and the girls are just helpless victims. I mean, you know, whereas maybe a guy is trying to give some girl emotional pleasure for the sake of getting physical pleasure and, he's, and she'll give him sex for the sake of feeling love. I mean, the using is going back and forth. I mean, when a girl sends a guy a sexual picture on the cell phone, it's not only him that's using her, it's, it's her in a sense using him, whether it's for social status or just for the satisfaction of the feeling of being wanted and desired when you don't even want yourself half the time. And so we've got to be able to rise above this culture of utilitarianism to love each other rightly, which is what we really long for. And what they found is like for at least teenagers, teenagers who have had sex, it's like 70% of them admit they wish they waited longer. It was kind of a disappointment. And most high school kids are virgins, which tells you the vast majority of young people are statistically quite open to this message of starting over, even if they've made mistakes. You know, Jason, you mentioned, you know, lust is easy, but virtue is acquired, right? It's something we have to do and we can do it. How do you give hope to youth when you talk about virtue, the virtue of chastity? How do they start on that path so they can acquire that strength that gives them freedom? Yeah, I mean, one of the things I point out to the guys, like one of the most important things to the high school students is that, like, in college, students, like, you got to surround yourself with good friends. You know, a friend of mine says, like, friends are like elevators. They either take you up or they take you down. Yeah. And if you're hanging around the wrong group of guys, then their sins become apparent. You're like, ah, oh, guys are really doing some bad stuff, so I'm doing pretty good here. But then when you surround yourself with godly men, godly women, you don't really look at their sins and their faults. You start to look at your own. It's almost like playing a sport with people who are five years less experienced than you are. 
you're not going to make a lot of progress. You start playing with people who are a couple divisions ahead of you in sports, and you up your game pretty darn fast just to keep up. It's the same thing with the life of virtue. You want to surround yourself with good people because you always become like your friends. And so, you know, virtue is just the habit of practicing a good. And so, yeah, it might feel a little clunky at first. It might feel like, oh, this is really hard. But it's like two magnets, when they're really close together, it's hard to separate them. But the more you create a distance, it's like, okay, this is doable. And so just pouring in the consolation, like it's not always going to be this hard mm. to pull away from these vices. It's that's, that initial separation from them, that's the most difficult. And yeah, you know, temptation is yeah. still going to remain, but you're going to able to be move around in the world with greater freedom as you break free and God gives you this gift. But I think ultimately that's so, it's a gift, that's not so a white important. knuckling repression kind of thing. It's a gift yeah. from God. And if we really want it, he'll bless us with that. Well, Jason, I think that's such an important point that a lot of young people don't realize, and that is, you know, when they struggle with chastity early on, it's not always going to be this hard. The more you practice it, uh, the easier it gets. And so it gets easy. I think some people feel like, if it's going to be this hard, you know, uh, the first day they're trying to break from porn, if it's going to be this hard every day of my life, I, I can't do it, I give up. But it's not going to be. And that's important for people to know. But let me give everybody the text line. If, if I, I want to invite the audience to submit your questions uh, to Jason and me. Make sure uh, you, you can use our text line or you can use the form platform. But if you use the text line, that is 720-650-0100. And you can just you know, uh, text your question. Uh, and we'll, we want you to become part of the conversation. And you can also leave questions on the chat part of the form platform under comments. And you can just put any kind of questions for us. We'd love to have you join our conversation. Well, Jason, what, where do you see hope right now? When it comes to this, you know, our culture is just so enmeshed in lust and pornography. Where's the hope for us right now? I think the young people are hope. Um, I, I have a tremendous confidence in them because even if they've been binging themselves on the wrong kind of love, I know it's not going to satisfy. Mm -hmm. And eventually there's going to be a boomerang. I mean, this pendulum of the sexual revolution, I feel like it's pretty much reached. As far, yeah, it's, it's getting crazy. It's probably going to get a little crazier. But all this stuff, I think, is going to be coming swinging back in the right direction. And I think the church needs to be ready, almost like a field hospital on a battlefield, to be able to tend to these people who are seeking healing from pornographic addiction and the sexual abuse that often flows from that. And so I think there's a lot of hope. I know you might not see it on the, on the news, but that's because the news shows us what we watch. And what we watch is all the bad stuff. I mean, news is a business. You know, I remember seeing on one of the news apps that I have, it said the top 10 news stories of 2020 or whatever. And I click, and like nine out of 10 of them were like murder, theft, adultery, you know, you know, all the negative stuff. And it's not because those are the objectively most important topics, but that's what we're clicking on. So it's not that we watch what they show us, they show us what we watch. And so we need to be careful to unplug a little bit to realize, hey, what I'm seeing on the, t on the screens might not be reflective of reality. And the very fact is like teen sexual activity rates have been going down for 30 years in a row. And it's the lowest numbers they've ever seen this past summer. The vast majority of high school students are virgins mm -hmm. and those who've had sex admit they wish they waited longer. And mm -hmm. so in the midst of all the bad news, there's a lot of good news as well. Young people want authentic love because the hookup culture is not satisfying. Yeah. Here's a single mother who asked Jason, you know, how as a single mother should she talk to her, uh, her son about pornography? Well, you know, one of the things, one of the benefits in a sense of being a single parent is that you're not asking your kid to follow a lifestyle that you yourself are not willing to follow. Because the standard of innocence for a 35 year old woman is the same for a 15 year old guy. Be perfect because the Heavenly Father is perfect. Now, ultimately, though, men learn manhood from men. And so try to put him in the presence of authentic men, whether it's a really good pastor, good youth minister, good grandpa, good uncle, to have him in the company of good men. If you can get him involved in a good youth group, something like that, it's really important. In terms of pornography, uh, we get approached a lot by guys saying, hey, look, I've been struggling with this for years. I don't know how to break free. What do I do? And so Matt Fradd and I recently came out with a book called Forged. And it's a 33-day program on how to break free from pornography. And every day of the book, you're going to get a free video on your phone from myself, Father Mike Schmitz, Jeff Cavins, uh, Father Jacques Philippe, Sister Miriam James, like every day a different person talk about it. Not just from like theological and spiritual, 
but from the neurological, from the psychological, the sociological, we've got psychologists on there and theologians and husbands and wives, and everybody kind of pouring their wisdom into this program every day for 33 days. It's going to give you a different weapon to break free from this. So I'd recommend get them the book Forge and just challenge them to do this. In the meantime, make sure you have those computers and phones locked down. CovenantEyes.com is very good for doing that. You just go to CovenantEyes.com, put in some screen-based filters on the MacBooks, the PCs, the iPhone, the Droid, whatever he's got. You've got to have that thing locked down. And then also ch check out Focus on the Family's website, Plugged In. Dot com that will give you movie television video game and music reviews and so if he asks hey can we get grand theft auto can i watch game of thrones you're like no that's porn here's why and yeah. so plugged in.com covenant eyes.com and then our website chastity.com but good on you don't be afraid to talk to your kid about this stuff i know it might be a little awkward or whatever man if you don't speak the world is going to fill the void of your silence with a very contrary message so be bold don't be afraid Great response, Jason. I God bless her for that. And I think that and there's there's these resources are. are I, I don't think any mother or father, for that matter, needs to be shy about dealing with pornography because every kid's going to be exposed to it. And, and it doesn't matter if you're. I, I know you know people think well if I'm homeschooled and I'm a Catholic homeschooling family and we only hang out with homeschooling families. You're not inoculated. Your kids are going to encounter other kids, and with the smartphones. It's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Yeah. It's everywhere. Yeah. Uh, and, and you can start early. There's a book called Good Pictures, Bad Pictures that you could read to your kid. And it basically explains to them, hey, there's some good pictures on the Internet and there's some not so good ones. Yeah. Some pictures even show people show parts of their body that should be covered up with a bathing suit. And if you see one of those pictures, here's what to do. Turn away your eyes. Close the computer. Come talk to mom and dad. You're not in trouble. In fact, we're the ones who are sorry that we didn't do a better job of protecting you from that. Yeah. That way, they have the game plan before they see the garbage mm. instead of being like, oh, my goodness, what is that? And getting sucked into this life of shame and isolation and addiction. That's, and so you have yeah. to have a bit of an inoculation, a preventative strike of letting them know this stuff is out there. And if and when they do see it. Here's how to respond. Here's how to react. You're not in trouble. We're on your team. Let's, you know, defend love from lust. Jason, I think a lot of people, um, we, we know a lot more about pornography now than we, did, than we did 30 years ago. And especially with video, it's far more addictive uh, than people ever thought pornography would be, especially with its, its accessibility. So warning kids that, um, that this, is, this is deeply addicting. And it's not about how strong you are. It just, it's addictive, and it's how strong and powerful this stuff is and how potent it is, and I think that's, that the idea of warning children about that is important. Here's a, uh, here's a wife who asks, my husband thinks that pornography is harmless. How do I approach this topic with him? Well, one thing I would do is make sure to check out the website, Bloom for Catholic Women. I think it's bloomforcatholicwomen.com or .org. This is a Catholic website specifically for wives who are struggling with this stuff in their marriages because this is a wound of sexual betrayal. The very fact that you say, well, I'm not actually doing it. It's like, really, is that what we were promising on the altar when we got married? I promise to be true to you uh, uh, and be faithful except with my eyeballs and my heart and my imagination just, just arrested me. Like, is it a, the fidelity of the person or just fidelity of a couple of body parts here? So I would tell him just this is breaking your heart and, and to pray for him, to fast for him, maybe call up some local convent of nuns, give them his first name and say, could you please pray for my husband that he could be delivered from this? And the website Bloom for Catholic Women will give you some conversational tips, some net networking, some fellowship to, to validate your feelings of being betrayed. Because a lot of guys, oh, you're just being uptight, you're being a prude, I'm not actually doing it. Other husbands are doing a lot of worse things than I am. But it's like, look, when a, a man turns to another woman for satisfaction, it cuts her deeply to the core. And she starts thinking, okay, am I not skinny enough? How do I compete with these women? It's like, no, you can't compete with them because they can't compete with each other. Yeah. It's not like a guy stays faithful to one pornographic website. He doesn't go anywhere else because she's, she's so captivating. No, because it trains him in a habit of mental polygamy where he's robbing himself of the joy of being captivated by one because he's staring at all these airbrushed, flawless supermodels that are essentially disposable. So it's not your job to keep up with them. Because like I said, they can't even keep up with themselves. You've got to be able to explain to this man, like, look, we entered into a marriage and fidelity was part of the deal. 
and this is breaking my heart. And for the love of our children, because like if a dad gets hooked on that stuff, I mean, it's blunt, but that's a spiritual vasectomy. I mean, his capacity to give the supernatural life to his family is severed from him if he can't even guard his own soul. And so ask him, like, if, honey, for, for love of me, you know, can we go to counseling and talk through this together if you feel he's not hearing you? If he doesn't want to go to counseling, go to counseling yourself without him. You need the comfort. You need the reassurance. Don't let him gaslight you and minimize your feelings and pretend like you're the problem because you're a prude. You need support. You're on the right track. And fidelity is not too much to ask. You know, it seems, Jason, that a lot of people get into this trap of self-deception when it comes to their sexual failings and their, their shortcomings with chastity. Why do you think people, um, you know, like, like this woman's husband, why do you think so many people like to minimize, well, pornography is not really a problem or, you know, other sexual issues. Why do you think people like to self-justify and self-deceive themselves? Well, I think when, whenever we sin, we, we always tend to justify. Oh, it's not a big deal. Yeah, I did it this weekend, but it's not like I'm doing it every weekend. Or, yeah, I did it with her, but she consented. Or, yeah, I did it with her, but we didn't go all the way. It's so, like, no matter what stage of lust you're in, you always try to look that it's not that. It could be a lot worse. Yeah, we did this, but she agreed to it. But, like, when you're doing something good, you don't make excuses for it. It's not like you're feeding the homeless with Christ in the city downtown, and then you're like, well, at least I'm not robbing a bank today. It's not that bad. It's like... We don't make excuses if our behavior is good. It's because our conscience is troubling us. And so we try to rationalize and justify. And it could also be because a lot of times when we don't understand our sexual, unwanted sexual behavior, we're more likely to feel ashamed in it. But if we can actually understand where is this craving coming from? When am I messing up? Is it when I'm bored and I'm lonely and I'm angry and I'm stressed and I'm tired? Well, maybe I need to find the right thing to do at those times instead of running to porn or alcohol or, or whatever it is. But then also there's an evangelical writer named Jay Stringer, and he made a really interesting comment. His point was that we're going about sex addiction recovery all wrong. We're treating it like a person's desires and fantasies and all that stuff is the problem. He said, I don't buy that. He said, I think that person's unwanted sexual fantasies and desires and that is the roadmap to their healing. Because if we sit still long enough just to listen to what is it that I'm craving there? Am I craving to be looked at? Am I craving to be seen? Am I craving to see another? Am I craving to humiliate a woman, to control a woman, to be controlled by a woman? Like, what is the legitimate unmet need there that I'm desiring that might have gotten twisted somehow earlier in my life that's making me desire in this warped way? And so he says that by looking at your desires, really listening to them, not for the sake of just indulging in them, but trying to find what is the legitimate unmet need that's crying out under this unwanted sexual behavior, because he says just having an ounce of compassion for your own life story is going to do far more for you than all the coping mechanisms and, and you know white knuckling strategies in the world. And so have a little compassion on yourself. Try to get to the roots and the triggers of this instead of treating it like lust is the only problem because that's like cutting the leaves off a weed in your garden. Don't get to that root system. It's all just going to sprout back up. Augustine had a great insight about that when he talked about his own addiction to lust and his own bondage. And he talks about how he, what he was really seeking was love and union with God and, and love of another. And, and it was hard for him to break from the bonds of lust. But once he did, he found that freedom that gave him a capacity to love like he never had before and it gave him a joy like he never had before. How can people look at love as a motivator to get them free to do the hard, arduous effort and work uh, of, of becoming chaste. Yeah, well, it's the only motivator that's going to work. Guilt, mm -hmm. shame, all that stuff is going to burn out. Eventually, if that's what's motivating you to get rid of porn, I mean, it, it'll give you some fuel to burn on, but eventually it's just, you're just going to give up. There's, in my eyes, only one thing stronger than the drive and the temptation of lust, and that's desire to love. And, and I tell guys, like, look, your body will do whatever you want, whatever you tell it to. I don't care how tempting that situation is. I said, for example, let's say you're sitting in your library in college and you're on your phone and you're looking at some pornographic images on Snapchat or Instagram. And then you notice out of the corner of your eye, 
is that one sophomore girl that you've had your eye on all semester and you've been waiting to meet her and now she's about to walk past you is you're looking at porn of your cell phone or you're going to be like oh no the desires are too strong i can't stop looking no you're going to be like oh you know back to quantum physics i'm studying here to be a doctor like man you would your body would do exactly what it told you to do because you had a stronger desire than the desire to lust and that's the desire to look noble to look honorable to look worthy as a suitor well, be that in reality. I mean, your character is who you are when nobody's watching. And so we've got to really look at, okay, am I one person at church on Sunday morning and a different guy Saturday at night? Chastity is about living that authenticity. But if we can keep love as the goal, like if I don't get rid of this junk, I mean, the, that's not even an option. I mean, do you really want to be some like 35 year old porn addicted dad who's got to slap your laptop shut when your six year old daughter walks in your office because she can't see what dad's seeing? It's not the father you want to be. So for love of your future bride, for love of your future kids, trash this junk. And because it's like a dragon standing between you and your vocation. You can't walk around that thing. You can't wait for it to die. You can't be like, just poke it a little bit and then go around going, it's just going to follow you into that kingdom and destroy the place. You got to cut that thing's head off, walk over its corpse and enter into your vocation. And so that's the main thing you got to slay. Because don't have, you got no business asking a girl out if you're still struggling with this stuff. Not only does it need to be removed, the wound needs to get healed. It's like I could stick a sword in you and pull it out and be like, oh, the sword's out, you're good. It's like, <laughs> no, like my, my intestines are on the floor. Like healing has to happen. And so remove it, find some accountability, because not only can you win this, you must win this. Mm, that's so important. Well, Jason, we've got uh, several questions that have come in that are about uh, chastity. Is there such a thing as chastity after you get married? And what does chastity look like in marriage? So those are a couple of the questions. How would you respond to that? No, it's a very good question because chastity is a virtue that applies to everybody regardless of their state in life, whether you're a priest, single person, religious, married. It applies to us obviously differently because chastity prior to marriage would involve continence and abstinence. Chastity within marriage does involve abstinence. People don't realize that. They know, oh, once you get married, all bets are off. And it's like, not really. Even within marriage, abstinence can be an expression of love. Whether you're traveling, whether your spouse is exhausted or sick or not interested or whatever, like abstinence can still be an expression of love. But then also within the context of marital intimacy, obviously pornography has no place within chastity in marriage. How do we plan our family? Do we listen to the church when it comes to natural family planning? And it's not that like NFP is the default. Like when we, we want to get married, we're, we're going to use NFP right away because, you know, we want to give three or four years to really get to know each other. And, you know, then we're going to have kids down the road. It's like, look, you want to get to know each other, have kids. You'll get to know each other real <laughs> good, okay? And so the, the default position isn't NFP. The default position is openness to life because children are the supreme gift of marriage. But there are circumstances where you might need to postpone the next pregnancy and that the church understands that. And God has already built into our bodies the capacity for that. And so with NFP, it taught me my wife's body's perfect. She doesn't need all the pills and drugs and shots. She just needs to be understood. So instead of suppressing her fertility with all these chemicals to conform to our desires, we conform our desires the perfect way our body has already been created. And so sins like contraception, sterilization, abortion, pornography, you know, those things would be violations against the virtue of chastity within the sacrament of marriage. What do you think keeps people from pursuing chastity, you know, today, most of all? I think one of the big ones is, that, well, obviously pornography and things like that, but the idea that sexual desire is lust, and that as long as they're experiencing sexual attractions or temptations or desires, then they're always failing God. In fact, I did a Q&A session for eight high schools at the same time in Canada last week, and one of the first questions that came in from the kids was like, if I'm physically attracted to somebody's face, is that the sin of lust? And it's like, whoa, I mean, imagine that poor high schooler thinking like his old life. If I'm attracted to someone else's face, <laughs> I'm lusting. Yeah. It's like, that's the idea. Like, well, if you just get pure enough, you're not going to have any sexual desires. Like, if you don't have any sexual desires, you're dead. Like, that's not holiness. That's like numbness. I love what John Paul II said. He said that when we grow in purity, we come to an ever greater awareness of the gratuitous beauty of the human body and its masculinity and femininity and that beauty becomes a light for our actions and so he's it's amazing what he says like you don't get numb to beauty you become more aware of it and that becomes a light to your actions that the body is an invitation to love 
not to lust. And so I think this misunderstanding mm -hmm. that sexual attraction is sin makes a lot of people give up because they experience the sexual attraction. Okay, that, that's a reaction. Biologically, it's normal. But now you have to choose a response. And then what lust is, is the reduction of the human person to their sexual value, whereas with chastity and love, it's realizing, yep, there is a sexual value there, but the personal value is more important than the sexual value. Jason, your explanation of these things are so important for people to hear, and I want people to know that uh, it's hard to believe we're, we're out of time, but I want people to be able to go to you and find some of your resources. And so I highly recommend that people go to chastity.com, which uh, Jason has set up this website. It's got all of his resources. You can find out resources for teens, for adults, how to deal with pornography, and so many other things. And so, Jason, you've done a ph phenomenal work for the church by uh, your apostolate and your mission. I, I hope more people come to hear about it and learn about it because there's such a great joy and freedom to discover the love that comes when you're chased. And I hope more and more people can encounter that and experience that. And I want to thank you for being with us and sharing uh, your wisdom with us tonight. So thank you very much. And I want to invite our, our audience next week. We're going to have Dr. Andrew Abella from Catholic University of America who heads up the business school there. And he's going to talk about Catholicism and capitalism. Uh, a lot of interesting questions have arisen lately about capitalism and what, what's the Catholic perspective on that? Tune in next week. We're going to discover and explore that topic. And again, Jason, thank you so much for being with us. Pleasure. Thanks so much. God bless you and God bless all of you who have watched. I hope that you've been edified and strengthened and encouraged by the truth of uh, chastity tonight. God bless you.